Religion is the coolest thing in the world. People are getting together to celebrate and learn about love and higher truths and God and try to live their principles together. It's great. If there's something we can all agree on, it's that religion is the best thing in the world. Huh? What's that? Not everyone agrees? In fact, there are large groups of people that think that religion is either the worst or close to being the worst thing in the world. And just about everyone, even people who like religion, has had at least one bad experience with religion or religious people. What's up with that? Was religion just a mistake from the start? Ironically, Swedenborg makes the claim that the Bible itself tells the answer. That very thing that so many people have abused for power has a covert warning about that very practice wrapped up in one of the most famous ancient architectural projects. How could the building of a tower and the proliferation of languages possibly offer commentary on the heinous acts committed by religious institutions throughout history? Well, that's the Swedenborg experience. Stay tuned. Welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg in Life. Great to have you. Thanks to everyone who came out and supported the 100th episode show. That was awesome. We're back in the studio here and we got some high quality content to bring to you. As always, my name is Curtis Childs and I'm the host. And you guys can be part of this conversation. You just got to get your questions and comments in wherever you are. And we'll try to run them at the end of the program, have a little back and forth about that. So glad you're joining us today. We're looking at where organized religion went wrong, and this is going to be couched in the story of the Tower of Babel. Do you know that story? It's in Genesis 11, and in summary, there's people all around the world. They have the same language. They talk to each other. They say, let's build a tower that goes all the way up into heaven, and they try it, and God comes down, confuses their language, and that's it, pretty much. It's a strange short story, but according to Swedenborg, full of potent meaning, and today we're going to delve into that in in looking at what was Swedenborg's original mission, which was to decode these stories and, and give us kind of the insights from them that had been lost. So glad you're here. If you haven't turned it off already, it's too late. You're too intrigued, right? No? Okay. Let's go to part one and see if we can hook you there. We're picking up this story actually just at the end of another episode that we did. There was uh, a sort of a series we've done of these biblical interpretations, and we did a, one about Noah and the flood. Uh, it's called The Meaning of Noah and the Flood, and actually that's a good one to watch before this. If you've got a spare hour right now, go do that. Uh, this is picking up right where that one ended. At the end of The Meaning of Noah and the Flood, there was this new church that was created, the ancient church, which is this new mindset for the human race. In this episode, you're going to hear about the church a lot, and as Swedenborg described it, this is a way of spiritual uh, awareness, a, a way of having spiritual awareness, a way of thinking about life that kind of, there was these epochs across human history, and we're sort of in the, we're in the second one, and this is the story of what happened, how that second one started good, and then started to trail off, and it explains a lot of why we are where we are now. So let's get right to it. When the when the it's so where the ancient church and when the ancient church began, everybody was in unity. Everyone had unity, and that was how it was supposed to be. And what we're going to do here is we're going to read this story of the Tower of Babel, and then we're going to read it like we were angels. Swedenborg says there is an internal sense to these biblical stories, which you'll see if you look at his series, Secrets of Heaven, or you'll see if you've watched any of our episodes. He says that angels, when they, when we are engaged in the external sense of these stories, they see only the internal sense. So we're going to read the external sense, get insight from correspondences, and then do the internal sense. So isn't that something you've always wanted to do? I just can imagine this being the first episode someone clicked on, and they're like, what is he talking about? It's only going to get more confusing from here. So let's begin our story This is Genesis 11, verse 1. And the whole earth had one language and the same words. There it is, short and sweet. So what does it mean? Is it literally saying that the whole earth had one language with the same words that you use to put it together? Swedenborg says that one language and the same words, everything in these stories deals 
with spiritual things. So this is actually a representation of the spiritual language, a.k.a. a view of doctrine, and we're going to explain more of that as we go. So here's it. At the time of the first ancient church, everyone shared a single overall view of doctrine. It may seem like these green strips are completely arbitrary when compared with the text, but if you read Sweden, where we're getting it from Swedenborg in his uh, series, Secrets of Heaven, there is a system to it. So see what the meaning of the overall story is, and then see if you dig it or not, and if it could be feasible. We're starting there with this overall view of doctrine, and this similarity, this unity in this group of ancient, the, the ancient state of the human race. He talks about this in Secrets of Heaven, this is 1284. He says, the whole earth had one language meant that a single broad view of doctrine existed everywhere. A language is doctrine, the earth is the church, and the same words mean that a single detailed view of doctrine existed, which is what we said before, but he goes on in Secrets of Heaven 1285 to describe it more. The first ancient church had one language in the same words, that is a doctrinal view that was united both in its general and its particular tenets, despite its broad spread throughout the globe. It displayed this unity even th though its forms of worship, both deep and shallow, shallow differed everywhere. And here, that, that's proof of the nature of the concept of Swedenborg's definition of church. He's saying this was a there were many different kinds of worship and practice throughout. We might look at today and say, these are different churches, but he said there was a shared focus on the deeper levels of it. It all had to do with love, and it had the same purpose. Like, everybody had different ways of practicing their religions, but they all knew this is about love toward the neighbor and toward the Lord, and this is, this is why we're doing this. And because everyone had that in the deepest part of their hearts, these external differences didn't matter as much. There was this unity of purpose, and that's actually how it's meant to be, There's a, the, the state the human race is meant to have, and Swedenborg describes it further in Secrets of Heaven 1285. So here's a little... Heaven contains a countless number of communities, each of them different, but still united, because the Lord leads them all as one. The reason they are able to act as one in this way is that heaven has a single stream of influence, which each individual receives according to his or her own character. The stream of influence consists of the emotional effect that the Lord in all his mercy and vital energy has on us. Even though there is a single stream, received in different ways, all things obey and yield to it as a united whole. This is the result of the love that heaven's inhabitants share. So that's heaven, but how how can people with different practices and doctrines be united? What does that look like when there's a, a divergence in the way that people worship? How can that all be one? Well, that's just the point he was getting to. So this is a continuation of that same number. A doctrinal view is united when everyone loves each other or displays charity. Mutual love and charity bring such people together into one, despite the variety among them, because it draws unity out of variety. When everyone practices charity, or loves each other, then no matter how many people there are, even if they number in the hundreds of millions, they share a single goal, the common good, the Lord's kingdom, and the Lord himself. Variety in doctrine and worship are like the variety of senses and organs in the human body, which contribute to the perfection of the whole. When doctrinal worship varies, then the Lord, working by means of charity, affects and acts on each of us in a way uniquely suited to our personality. In this way, He fits each and every one of us into the order of things, on earth just as in heaven. Then, as the Lord himself teaches, his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And that, that unity and that having the Lord as present on the earthly level as he is in heaven, that's how it was at first in this ancient church. There had just been this collapsing of humanity that represented by the flood, but people came out of that. God had established this new pathway. Everything was going really good, man. We were in great shape. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily stay like that, but but for a little while, we had something really good. So let's focus on that. This is further about it, Secrets of Heaven 1285. Uh, he says, such was the case with the first ancient church. Uh, 
There were as many general categories of inner and outer worship in it as there were nations, and as many subcategories as clans in the nations, and as many specific types as there were people in the church. Yet they all had one language and the same words, which is to say, they all had one doctrinal view in general and in particular." which we got to before, and it's that importance of the unity of purpose, that you can be very different, but if you're all going for the same goal, and that goal was a spiritual, a good one, it's actually better that you're different, because you complete the picture and are able to do more things in your in more nuanced ways. Further in Secrets of Heaven 1288, specifics and doctrinal teachings do not matter as long as they focus on a united goal, which is to love the Lord above all and to love our neighbor as ourselves, since the specific teachings then fit with these general principles. And that's you'll find that across Swedenborg's description of heaven. He says that heaven is never the same for any two individuals. People of any faith can go there, provided they live what's good. You, you, there's many different interpretations of things. It seems to be a pretty big tent that people can get under, and that's how it was. There was a state of basically that heaven on earth here. Everybody was glad that they were different. Everyone knew, even though we're coming at this in different ways, we're doing it for good. So that's great, but we didn't tune in to see a story about great stuff. We tuned in to see where religion went wrong. So let's get to some drama, right? And as you may know, if you've read the Tower of Babel story, things don't stay so tranquil. The process begins now in part two. We have where the story begins to go bad, and the lingering effects of this collapse that we're about to read about are still here. Like, this is part of the story of why not just religion is like it is and has been historically, but also why the human experience is like it is. So it's worth worth knowing. I can't believe they don't teach us in high school history or whatever. This is Secrets of Heaven 1283. The present topic is the ancient church in general and the fact that its inward worship was falsified and adulterated as time passed. Its outward worship accordingly suffered the same fate because outward worship mirrors inward. The falsification and adulteration of inward worship is portrayed as Babel here. All right, so there we have our first glimpse into what Babel is. It's this falsification and adulteration. But what does that mean? Essentially, the intentions behind their worship were corrupted. There was no longer this driving force behind religious rituals and religious gatherings that we're going to learn to love each other and and love God. Instead, something else began to creep in. So let's look at the next verse, and I say we're looking at this as the angels would in the inner meaning, but as Swedenborg describes it, there are multiple inner meanings. So it's not just a one-to-one, we're merely picking out one thread that this story is telling us, which is this historical account of the human race. So if it seems like, well, that's all that means, <clears throat> this is just a part of it. So here it is, though, with that aside, the story continues in Genesis eleven two. And it happened, when they set out from the east, that they found a valley in the land of Shinar, and settled there. What do we got here? It seems like relatively benign. You know, people just go somewhere and camp somewhere and live somewhere. That's not so bad, right? Let's see what it means, though, in the internal sense. Swedenborg says, <clears throat> when they set out from the East means they backed away from charity. And you'll get that because the East is always a symbol of what's heavenly. And to move out of that means you're leaving spiritually. A spiritual geography change is a change of heart that you are no longer coming from love, so you're out of the east. They found a valley in the land of Shinar, means their worship grew unclean and profane, and we're going to talk about why that particular land and that valley there uh, means that in a second. And they settled there, that's the way that they live, so they've changed the way they live. So the internal thread of the story we're following right now could be read as follows. And it happened, when people backed away from charity, that their worship grew unclean and profane, and that's the way they began to live. So, that's a quite a different story, and quite a much more dramatic story, but it may seem still, like, is this arbitrary? Why, why does this land of Shinar symbolize this negative worship? Why is it like that? Well, let's go back to some basic correspondences. Swedenborg says this is all written in this symbolic language. It's the language that we dream in. It's the language of nature. It's, it's a universal language, and here, if we know how to read it, 
you know, if we got our Rosetta Stone, then we can figure it out. So why the land of Shinar? Let's look at, at uh, we, to figure that out, we got to look at mountains and valleys. So first, let's do mountains. Mountains are a symbol of love or charity, an aspect of worship that reaches highest or deepest. And you don't got to really stretch that much to see that, oh, this is representing like the deepest spiritual endeavors of the soul, because when we see mountains, it takes our breath away. And Swedenborg would say that that's because mountains are a living, like a physical image of this spiritual thing. So something in us resonates with them. Because you think about it, mountains are like, they're hard to climb, they're dangerous, you can't grow food on them. Why do we love them so much? It's because they're this symbol of this thing. So that's mountains. And then, if that's the inward worship, then valleys are what's between. This is symbolic of more outward worship on a more surface level, which is fine. You got to have both parts. You can't have a mountain, you know, mountains close to each other without having a valley or a low point, or else there wouldn't be any such thing as a mountain. It's good to have a valley. We got to have both in us. We got to have our very, very deep core principles, and we got to have sort of the external things that we do to make things solid in our life, in our pursuit of whatever morality or spirituality or religion we're in. However, this valley in the land of Shinar was particularly a corrupt valley because of, not because the people that lived there in ancient times, uh, were bad or something like that, um, but it's just because that of the the location and the way it's mentioned in the story that it's this is a this is a bad valley. We're in a bad external worship, and uh, for what it's worth, um, Swedenborg does not say this story happened literally. This is this is a this is an analogy. This is a figurative tale. He doesn't say these events actually transpired on this earth. He does say other parts of the Old Testament literally happened, but not this one, for what it's worth, just to stir the pot a little bit there. He talks about it further, Secrets of Heaven 1292. The present verse describes how the church went downhill by setting out from the east, that is, by starting to draw back from neighborly love. The further the church or its members depart from charity, the further its worship departs from holiness, and the closer that worship approaches to being unclean and profane. So it's not, and you notice there, that it's not even about you know, churches decay when they start to drift away from the truth or from their first principles or something like that. No, it's it's when you drift away from love, that it, your doctrine is secondary, because it doesn't matter how good or how tight your doctrine is or how accurate your doctrine is, if you don't have that love behind it, it becomes profane, that love is this essential quality. But here we have these people moving away from that love, and because their desires began to be corrupt, True ideas no longer supported them. You know, when you, like somebody who has a spiritual awakening and or near-death experience gets taught kind of the reality about the universe and about life, oh, it all makes sense and everything's about love. They always say everything's about love, that when you see the truth about things, you see how it's about love. So if people are, these people are getting out of the truth, they, these are out of love, these true ideas no longer fit. So they had to manufacture false ideas in order to support what they were doing. And this is where we get into the old stone versus brick. One, two, three. <laughs> these are real, and they're heavy. Um, look at these. One of these is not like the other, and the other one is not like the other. These are quite different, and this is a correspondence. This is a symbol of the difference between f true ideas and manufactured ideas. And we're going to look at that here in Genesis 11.3. And they said, a man to his companion, Come, let us make bricks and bake them until baked. And they had brick in place of stone, and tar they had in place of mortar. Again, this is full of symbolism, and hopefully you're starting to pick up on it enough where you're like, okay, what, what is this going to mean? What is this going to mean? I want to point out that this says they had brick in place of stone, and tar they had in place of mortar. There's an implication that things are not as they should be naturally. So let's see what this symbolism is all about. First, come let us make bricks means falsities they would invent. Bake them until baked is the e evil rising out of self-love or, or self-importance, because there's always a component of truth or falsity and a component of good or evil. You know, there's an intellectual and then an emotional one, and the emotion is that heat, 
you know, that bakes these false ideas. Do you get what I'm saying? They had brick in place of stone, means they had falsity instead of truth, and tar they had in place of mortar, the evil they craved instead of goodness. So let's let's see what would our uh, angelic inner sense read for this part of the story. And a way of life began in which people invented false doctrines to serve their selfish desires. They used false ideas instead of true ideas. They were motivated by evil desires instead of good desires. When we say correspondence, you can see in these objects here, uh, like that I've just been holding here, no problem this whole time, that you've got a stone, which this is, if, if the physical world is an analog of the spiritual world, nature, what's, what's, what's not created by people, this is like God. This is like the, the lasting truths, whereas this brick, it's actually sort of a paver, but you know, what kind of budget do we have here? This, this is something you manufacture, right? This, this is building with the blocks of reality that are provided. This is like, well, I want it to be this way, so I'm going to make it this way. Or that's what that, everything has a good and bad correspondence, so sometimes bricks are great before we get letters from the Brick Society, but, or Brick Layers Society, but there are, there, in this particular time, this is you're rejecting what's what's truly there, what is millions and millions of years old, what has withstood the test of time, been forged in the great crucible of the earth, and you're just throwing together some brick and baking it in your own oven, right? That's the difference. And then further, the stuff they use to stick the things together, tar. Uh, we have a picture of tar here. This is actually like a procession in the UK uh, where tar has these flammable components to it. You got to kind of bake it a bit, or get it uh, confined to make it actually light up, but it's got these flammable sulfurous components in it, and Swedenborg says that symbolizes the selfish cravings, that they were using this to stick their bricks together. And then the mortar that they would normally use that they didn't is actually a symbol. It's more like clay. It's like goodness. You know, it, it, it uh, is benign. It's malleable. Actually, there's a lot of good correspondence in it, Mortar is similar to that, so but they they uh, rejected that and they wanted this tar instead. So there you have the symbolism of they're building something. We don't quite know what it's for yet, but they're taking false ideas and sticking them together with evil cravings to try to build it up. Now I want to say something about false ideas. There's two sources of false idea, says Swedenborg. And which one you're coming from matters a lot. The first kind of falsity that he identifies comes from ignorance. So this would be, you know, we can fall into errors of ignorance as a result of if we were taught from childhood and onward something false. We were indoctrinated or somebody misled us. We, we pick up false ideas. Or everyday life is distracting us from inquiring into the truth. We're too busy to really look into a thing. Okay, so then we just hang on to some things that are readily available that aren't true. We can't really discriminate well between truth and falsity. We just don't have that particular wisdom in that area. So these are just, these are just errors. These are just ignorance, uh, benign ignorance. And Swedenborg says about this in Secrets of Heaven, 1295, this kind of misinformation doesn't do much damage as long as we avoid entrenching ourselves in it with multiple arguments and convincing ourselves under the goading of some selfish desire to lend it our support. To do this is to thicken the cloud of ignorance and to make it so dark that we cannot see the truth. Essentially, it's if you don't know something because you just didn't know it or you were misled or something, it's not that big a deal, unless you, because of some foul aim, like it's going to get you ahead of other people, or you've staked your reputation on it, you really, really pull that into you, it's not a big deal. And Swedenborg says, in the afterlife, it's dissipated very easily if it's not already been dissipated in this life. However, there's another kind of falsity, and this falsity comes from corruption. Falsity is corrupt when it's driven specifically by greed, self-love, or materialism. And as we've said in other shows, self-love does not mean like thinking you're a good person. It means only caring about yourself. It'd be ego concerns. Um, when those are driving us to falsity, then that's a problem. And this, that corruption was what we're dealing with here, with these people in this story. So they were in the falsity for the bad reasons. And this is Secrets of Heaven 1295 that we're going to look at next, where he talks further about it. 
Falsity is greed-driven when it starts with corrupt desires, or in other words, with self-love and materialism. We might take up a certain tenet of doctrine, for instance, and avow it publicly in order to seize hold of the popular mind and become a leader. We might interpret or distort that doctrine to our own advantage, arguing from factual evidence and at the same time quoting from the letter of the word to confirm our views. Worship stemming from such behavior is profane, no matter how pious it seems on the outside, because on the inside it is not worship of the Lord, but of ourselves. Furthermore, we fail to acknowledge anything that really is true, except to the extent that we can explain it to our own advantage. This kind of worship is what Babel symbolizes. The case is different, however, with those who have been born and brought up into this kind of worship, who do not know that the the thinking is wrong and who live a life of love for others. It is not so much the worship itself as the quality of the person worshiping that determines whether it should be described as profane. And we get, first of all, a caveat saying, you know, it's different case by case, but we also get a further definition of Babel, which is only caring about any kind of doctrinal tenet or any life law when it will favor you. So you're beginning to pull on it for its power. And that leads us into why were they building this tower in the first place? Why were, were this ancient group of people building this system of doctrine and thought in their mind, what were they after? We're going to look at that now in part three. The darkest ambition. What is the darkest ambition? Essentially, it is wanting total control over other human beings. That is, according to Swedenborg, the root of all evil, that or the deepest, darkest evil, is to want to possess and control the lives of other people. And this is the driving force behind this tower and what they were trying to do with it. And we learn more in Genesis 11, 4. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its head in the sky. And let us make ourselves a name to keep from being scattered over the face of the whole earth. It doesn't seem, I mean, initially, it doesn't seem that bad. They're like, we, we don't want to be scattered around. Let's just make a tower in a city. Nothing, nothing bad about that. Externally seems pretty benign. What's the internal sense of the whole thing? So Swedenborg says, let us build ourselves a city and a tower means they made up their own doctrine and worship. So they fabricated this new system. There was already one in place, remember, but with its head in the sky was the goal of controlling heaven, meaning also the heaven inside people, that we can take that highest part in people, and by telling them, oh no, this is how it is, we can gain control of them. Let us make ourselves a name means they wanted to gain a reputation for power. They're doing this essentially to set themselves up or they wouldn't be acknowledged because they're seeing that this current system of everybody's all about love and everything, that doesn't really favor us. So reread our verse looks like this. People decided to make up their own doctrine and forms of worship to try to gain control of everything even heaven. They wanted a reputation of power because otherwise they would not be acknowledged. And the darkest of the dark part of that ambition with this tower is that they were looking to not just gain control of people, but to use religion as a means of control, to use religion as a means of power, and not as a means of love and of connection to God and everything it's supposed to be, but this is how we can get people to do what we want them to do. Swedenborg talks about this in Secrets of Heaven 1304. The nature of religion is such that when charitable love for our neighbor disappears and love for ourselves replaces it, we disregard what faith teaches, except so far as we can turn it to the purposes of self-worship. We also despise everything holy in worship unless it benefits ourselves, and so unless it forms a part of self-worship. All self-love entails this consequence, because when we love ourselves more than others, we hate everyone who does not serve us and refuse to favor such people unless they become our slaves. Not only that, so far as any restraints on us are loosened, we run wild, even to the point of lifting ourselves up above God. These are the things symbolized by the city and the tower. Self-love and every desire that rises out of it is the vilest, most profane thing that exists and is the epitome of hell. 
From this, everyone can draw her or his own conclusion about what worship is like when it harbors such a quality inside it. Again, look at, uh, we had an episode uh, called The Good Thing About Hell. Check that out for a little more on this negative, this self-love that he's describing. It's not like I said before, it's not self-esteem, it is only loving yourself, is wanting yourself to be ahead of the rest of the world. So Swedenborg is making this claim that there are people who abuse religion and religious principles to gain power. Uh, But does that really happen? Well, who am I to talk about that? Let's see if we can get someone else in here with a perspective on this study of this, this phenomenon that we're here describing as the Tower of Babel. Well, the study of power and the abuse of power in religion has really mushroomed in the last 30 to 40 years, uh, both in the uh, academies of secular religious studies departments at universities, but also even in the church divinity schools themselves in Europe and in the United States. And the study of power and the abuse of power is under great scrutiny because there are so many examples of of, uh, of, of problematic behaviors by religious people. Um, and the reason why religion can be so abusive is because it speaks to ultimate matters. And it has narratives that uh, can claim a full allegiance of mind and heart and the subjectivities of, the, of its adherents. And so when it's believed that ultimate matters are at stake, uh, people will often go to extraordinary extents to uh, defend and uphold what they believe are those those ultimate things. Um, however, there are other abuses of power that we can mention that are, are much more obviously uh, self-gratifying. So we might think of sort of three categories of, of religious abuse in history. One would be uh, state and political uh, abuse of power uh, in religion. Another would be the intellectual uh, abuse uh, in social thought and domination of, uh, of cultural thought. Uh, and finally, there's um, such a thing as pastoral abuse, just on an individual level of exerting power over other people. So do you want to see uh, examples of those three kinds? Yeah, I bet you do. It, since we couldn't cover the whole history of religious abuse, Let's just focus on, since we're doing this from a Swedenborgian perspective, let's look at his cultural tradition, which was Christianity, right? It was, we'll do it from within his own group so it doesn't look like we're just taking pot shots at other people. And Christianity is a good one to look at because it's the, still the world's largest religion. Um, and it was actually not a big religion for a while after the time of Jesus, but it was really when the emperors in Rome began to convert to Christianity. Uh, that was when it not only grew a lot, but became a political, social power that could really exert control over people. So these are examples of those kinds of religious abuse that happened within the Christian tradition. So let's begin with the first one. One, Just one example would be the story of how the European nations uh, developed colonial exploitation uh, of... Uh, of, of uh, the entire continent of Africa, and developed a um, an economic fusion of uh, of a slave trade that lined the pockets of Christians all throughout Europe, and uh, maneuvered uh, a subject population at their whim and will under uh, very ugly, horrific conditions, under the guise and under the belief that they had a culturally superior way. Of uh, of doing things, and that it was, and that it was actually good for these subject populations to be under their thumb. Today, we look back at that with tremendous horror uh, and have a difficult time understanding how such large numbers of Christians could uh, be under that persuasion. And that people in positions of power knew to pull something like this off we've got to say religion justifies it. And you'll see this in all kinds of exercises of power, that people who would normally have conscience and wouldn't let something go, if if they're given a religious justification for it, they'll go along with things that they wouldn't normally go along with. So that's part of the toxic nature of this religious control. So that's only one of the ways that religion can be used as a dominant force. Let's look at this intellectual domination. 
The intellectual abuse and domination in Christian history is also significant. We see about a four to 500 year period, beginning with the medieval inquisitions, moving all through the early modern period with the violent attempts of the Protestant breakaway uh, with uh, centuries full of people being burned at the stake for having the wrong ideas. So heresy becomes um, a, a prominent feature of religious life for half a millennium um, in Europe again with people saying the wrong things and, uh, and being taken to the stake for it. So not even just, you can't think differently than me. If you do, I'm going to kill you. And we're going to get society to agree that you have to be killed because we're the religious people. We know what's going on. That's a pretty significant abuse of power. And it had all kinds of negative consequences for the advancement of humanity. So there we have two. But then there's this third, the most sort of intimate, personal uh, leveraging of religion to, to cause all kinds of harm. So here's Jim again. Thirdly, the form of pastoral abuse is extremely pressing in our modern world. Uh, there's another form of, of religious domination that can occur just simply in personal relationships with the status that religious leaders can attain uh, over their adherents. So we have situations like uh, Jonestown and Heaven's Gate. Uh, where a charismatic leader is able to uh, convince uh, large numbers of people to uh, commit mass suicide uh, simultaneously. I think that is, uh, that is seen by most people as uh, a, a sad and, and, um, and harrowing kind of power that a religious figure was able to gain over, over his people. And then we have a, a, such a rife... Um, uh, recent history of uh, sexual abuse uh, in, with religious figures, not limited to uh, Christianity. Uh, religious figures in all of the major faith traditions in the last 30 years, uh, we, we've seen uh, significant cases of, of, um, of sexual abuse of, of people that, uh, trusted, that the, trusted them and were under their sway. Do not not just Christianity, it, it's widespread, and you see religion committing sort of the worst acts that we can think of, and what's interesting, well, really ironic or sad about it happening within the Christian tradition, all of these examples is they're the opposite of what Jesus Christ taught and, and lived, so you have people able to, when they s distort religion, kind of build this tower out of these bricks and, and tar, they can make it into something that it's completely not and use it to just wreak havoc on the world. So why does it work? Why is religion so effective as a tool of power? And uh, Jim commented on it a little bit earlier, but Swedenborg also has a few things to say. Secrets of Heaven 1308. And let us make ourselves a name means so as to gain from this a reputation for power, as the symbolism of making a name for themselves shows. They recognize, after all, that everyone wants to practice some kind of worship. Since people who build Babylonian towers realize this, they make a name for themselves through doctrine and piety. Otherwise, they would be unable to win the adulation of others. This is symbolized by the very next clause, that otherwise they would be scattered over the face of the whole earth, or in other words, would not be acknowledged. From this it also follows that the higher into heaven such people can raise their heads, the more of a name they make for themselves. Their domination is strongest when those who have a modicum of conscience, since with those who have a modicum of conscience, since the, they lead these people anywhere at will, but they have a plethora of external restraints for controlling those who lack conscience. So people who have something good in them, and they know, oh, I, I got to um, do, I got to follow religion, uh, they're the most vulnerable. To this whole thing. And just in case you're wondering about these phrases here, you know, this is Swedenborg metaphorical language. Building Babylonian towers, we're not talking about people who build literal towers, we're talking about people who put together false ideas with the intent of domination. And then when he says, higher into heaven, such people can raise their heads, this is not literally into heaven, heaven is not up, it's a state of mind. But it means the further that they can advance and pry into the depths of doctrine and religious understanding, to further manipulate the people who believe in it and to unlock sort of the mysteries that it, it does reveal about life and to use that uh, against humanity. And Swedenborg says that 
in hell. Evil spirits are all about this. They learn correspondences. They learn these truths about religion so that they can try to manipulate. And it's just like you see on this planet, people will learn about how computers work and how the credit card system works so that they can hack yours. Wherever there's a system, there's going to be people who are trying to exploit it. And we're trying to spread a little awareness so that you'll protect your religiosity just like you protect your credit card in one of those little sleeve things. All right, now we have people who are trying to accomplish this heinous goal, and you have the impact that that can have. So is this going to be allowed to happen? Is there going to be some kind of effort to stop this tower from being built? Well, we'll find out in part four. We're going to get into this thing that Swedenborg calls a judgment. And a lot of people have judgments about the term judgment, because religion, when misused, has made a lot of people feel very guilty and worried about a judging God. However, there is actually judgment in a positive sense, or in a Swedenborgian sense, that, that doesn't hold that same uh, doesn't hold that same baggage, hopefully, for people. And we want to get into what that is, because it is a major factor in this Tower of Babel story that we're getting into here. Let's continue in the text with the next verse. This is Genesis 11, verse 5. And Jehovah went down to see the city and tower that the children of humankind were building. There's got to be symbolism in that, because there's no way that Jehovah has got to go down to see something. Like, where was he before? Is it too far for him to see? Well, if he had binoculars, would he not have to go down? So what does that mean, Jehovah went down to see? So according to Swedenborg, this talk of God descending, this symbolizes a judgment. We're going to look at what a judgment is soon. To see the city and the tower is a the judgment on their perversion of doctrine and worship, and that, that they were building that is, means that this, all this doctrine was invented by them. So there we, have, there we have the symbolism of the verse. This is how it would read if we could see the internal sense, or something akin to this with our eyes. And a judgment began on the perverted doctrine and profane worship that people had invented for themselves. And Swedenborg comments further on this in his Secrets of Heaven 1311. If you're following along, you can download this, these books and just read this whole, his whole explanation. You won't even need this show. Wait, don't do that. For, forget I said it. Jehovah the Lord is present everywhere and knows everything from eternity, so he cannot be said to come down to see, which is what I was just saying. Only the letter of the story speaks in these terms, and doing so it adapts to the human way of seeing things. The true inner sense does not. So in the current instance, the inner sense presents coming down to see as a judgment. It is called a judgment when evil reaches its peak. The word expresses this as a time when things in general culminate or when wickedness does. So we're getting our definition of judgment here. The situation is that every evil has limits it is allowed to reach. When it goes beyond these limits, it brings evil on itself as a punishment. This is true at a specific and at a general level. The evil it brings on itself as punishment is what is then called a judgment. So there you have your judgment definition. At first it seems as though the Lord does not see or notice that anything bad is happening, because when we go unpunished for the evil we do, we think the Lord does not care. The moment we pay a penalty is when we first believe the Lord sees, and we even imagine He inflicts the punishment. It is because of these appearances that then that the text says Jehovah went down to see. And you could see implied in there that God is not doing this punishment, that, that this judgment that we're talking about, it's a lot like the concept of karma, that what goes around comes around, that once you do enough stuff, you naturally call something back on yourself. This is the way it is with the evil, and it's like the physical world works. There's a, there's a correspondence in the physical world, that there are systems here that when they reach a certain point, you know, they, they can withstand some abuse, but when they reach a certain point, something happens that's irrevocable and the situation has changed. And we're going to illustrate it here with the most elegant metaphor of all time, the tipping chair. Hmm. 
<laughs> so if you have ever tipped over in something, you know that you can you can be in a chair and abuse the system. You can lean back when it's not supposed to be leaned back on. But there is a moment, and if you're sitting in the chair, you can very much feel it when we're going down. <laughs> you can tell we're going down, that we have crossed this place where the momentum where just the laws of gravity, something's happening. That is the essence of this judgment thing. It's not an arbitrary, God is sitting there and something just rubs him the wrong way, so he's like, that's it, I'm judging this. This is evil automatically calls this on itself, because God is protecting everything. But evil is the rejection of God. So the more that we reject God, finally it gets to a point where we no longer have the protection, and then a series of events unfolds, which we're going to look at now. This is when the consequences began. It's represented in the story by Genesis 11, verse 6. And Jehovah said, Look, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they are starting to do. And now nothing would be prohibited to them that they thought to do. In the literal sense, it kind of seems like God is just ruining the party for no reason. Like, look, the people are together, and they want to do this, and if we don't stop, no one will. But they just want to build a tower, right? But when you look at the symbolism, you see that this is, this is actually love and wisdom doing something that has to be done. So the people all have this one language. Remember back in the beginning, they all had the same doctrine. And this is what they are starting to do, means they're turning this one doctrine, this one thing that everybody shares, toward an evil goal. And so unless their status changes, nothing is going to stop them from this aim. And that that's, how, that's how it is for us. Unless something interrupts our life, we don't let go of our goals. More on that in a moment, but first let's look at this, the people and the language being the same. And Swedenborg describes this in Secrets of Heaven 1316. We're going to look at... Oh, 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 first, before we get to that, I guess we should look at our... Um, this is what the verse would look like as, uh, as just the internal sense. So that you, we're doing this so that you guys can hopefully have an easier time putting it all together uh, with the narrative. So here it is. People all had the same doctrine, and they were turning it toward an evil goal. They would keep pursuing that evil goal unless their conditions changed. Video. Oh, hey, so um, that is the me talking about how a video is next, which is true, um, <laughs> because we're like, do we go right to the quote next? No, it's a video. As I was uh, busy setting up before I forgot that we had that last little clip in there, there is this concept of the people and their language being all the same, which Swedenborg goes into further here of what this looks like and the downsides of it being corrupted. So this is from Secrets of Heaven 1316, and we're going to get a deeper look into what that all means. The people and their language are said to be one when everyone adopts the common good of society, the common good of the church, and the kingdom of the Lord as a goal. Under those circumstances, the Lord, who brings about the unity of all, is present in the goal. When we adopt our own welfare as the goal, however, the Lord cannot be present in any way. Our very self-absorption pushes him away. Under these circumstances, we deflect and divert to ourselves the common good of society, the common good of the church, and even the Lord's kingdom, treating them as if they exist for our own sake. In this way, we take what is the Lord's away from Him and replace it with ourselves. When this attitude takes over in us, a reflection of it lurks in each of our thoughts and even in the smallest facets of our thoughts. That is how it is with a person's dominant trait. The fact is not as obvious during bodily life as it is in the other life, where our dominant characteristic reveals itself through a kind of aura that everyone around us perceives. Because you're messing up the system. There's the way that humanity is constructed is that when we're working towards this common goal, which you saw them listed there, of love, of collaboration, everybody benefits. But when we start to reverse this and twist it, the system begins to break down, and that's what these people were starting to do. It was the goals, it's the goals that unites people, and it was the goals that was becoming that were becoming corrupted. Swedenborg talks about this in Secrets of Heaven 13, 17. 
He says, starting to do symbolizes their thinking or their intention, and so their goal, as can be seen from the next clause, and now nothing would be prohibited to them that they thought to do. The reason a goal is symbolized at an inner level is that the Lord regards nothing in us but our goal. No matter what thoughts we have thought or deeds we have done in all their countless permutations, as long as our purpose is good, these things are all good. So if you're agonizing over stuff that you've done, lighten up. When our purpose is bad, on the other hand, those things are all bad. Our final goal is what prevails in every single thing we think or do. Whatever we aim at is our actual life. The, the aim brings everything we think and do to life, since again it embraces everything we think or do. So the nature of our goal determines what our life is like. A goal or purpose is nothing but love, because the only thing we can adopt as a purpose is something we love. And Swedenborg uses that term love in both a positive and negative sense. So you can, love is an affinity for something. You can have an affinity for good things, you can have affinity for bad things, but what you're thinking about and planning on, that becomes your life. That is what makes us up. So if we have a bad goal, if if we're scheming daily on things that are harmful, we will pursue those without interruption unless something in the situation changes. You see, this person here, this is proof of that, because this person here has got a goal, got a set of priorities, and that's what they think about, and that's what they're going to do. But it takes some kind of situational change, like a shakeup in their life, or perhaps the tower you're building doesn't work out, to, to suddenly, you know, it can be an illness, it can be an event, who knows what it is, but suddenly we rethink things. We don't have our sights locked in on that goal, and instead, we have a chance to ponder and resettle and see what's important in life, and then divine providence can get in there and set us up with new goals and priorities. And this process of regeneration or spiritual growth, the essential process of life on earth, is God uh, essentially—sorry, I just said essential twice—is God moving our goal ever so slightly, making these micro-adjustments in what our goal is until we end up Instead of having our goal, these negative things, selfish things, we have the good of the human race, or we have love as our goal, and then that allows us to open up into the mindset of heaven and all the, the joy and everything that comes with that. And he talks about it more in Secrets of Heaven 13, 18. With people like those described above, nothing is prohibited that they think to do unless their circumstances change. The thought of doing something is the same as an intention, or in other words, a purpose. No human purpose can ever be prevented, changed in other words, unless conditions change in the person, because our final goal constitutes our actual life. When conditions change in us, our goal also changes, and with the goal, our thinking. And that, I think, may be a reason why life is so chaotic, why there is so much change and unknown. There are so many unknowns. There is so much turbulence, because that is what allows us to to recalibrate. That is what makes space for God to say, maybe we should think about this a little bit. Without interruptions, we would get too entrenched. You know you know that when, that when people surround themselves with yes people, people who are only going to feed back what they want to hear, they end up going way off course because there's no checks, there's no balances. These events are those, right? So we have these people in our story set on this really negative goal of dominating everyone through this fabricated religious set of teachings, but they've incurred this judgment, they got, they'd put too much evil together, they've tipped the chair. So what happens next? Part five. What happened? What, what's the effect of a judgment if, if uh, you're, you're part of that group of people and you incur a judgment on yourself? What are the symptoms of a judgment? The first thing is that th- that they and a lot of people lost their ability to know truth. And really, the human race lost its ability to know truth on a deeper level. And this is described in Genesis 11.7. Come, let us go down and muddle their language there, so that a man will be unable to understand the language of his companion. Because on an external level, it's it's strange. It's like, why create so many languages? Linguists would be very glad that this happened, it, but it doesn't seem like, is that really that big a 
curse? Like, what? what's the moral component to that? Why is that the punishment for making a tower? But if you look at it spiritually, it's much more about the core parts of our minds and hearts. So here's the, the specifics. Let us go down is the judgment. Again, this is the idea of God descending and muddle their language there. No one knows any doctrinal truth. Because remember it said before, the people had one language, and that was just one understanding. So this is instead the opposite. Nobody really has the understanding. So that a man will be unable to understand the language of his companion, they will all begin to clash. And we're going to talk about that clash here. So, But let's hear, the, let's hear this verse in, in one of its internal senses. A judgment occurred, and people lost the knowledge of inner truth. As a result, they began to use their invented doctrines to clash with each other. Why did they start to clash? We're going to look into this. Now, first let's go to Secrets of Heaven. Again, where Swedenborg continues to move through and comment on this. This is 1321. Um, At an inner level, muddling, (laughs) which is like a great Harry Potter sounding word almost, something symbolizes not only darkening it, but also obliterating it and scattering it to the winds so that there is no longer anything true about it. When self-worship replaces worship of the Lord, all truth is perverted. Not only is it perverted, it is also abolished. And in the end, falsity is acknowledged as truth and evil as goodness. All the light of truth comes from the Lord and every bit of darkness from humankind. When human beings take over the Lord's role in worship, the light of truth becomes darkness. Then people see light as darkness and darkness as light. This fact is obvious in the other world, where such people not only fail to acknowledge the truth they proclaim during bodily life, but even hate and attack it. So he's saying that people who were immersed in religious stuff, but inwardly were not immersed in the counterparts in aims and goals, which meaning love to the human race, they, in the next life, they completely reject religion. They, they push it away, they, they can't, because you can't fake stuff like that. Your inner nature comes out, so they, even if they had been, you know, priests of high order, good at giving sermons, they reject all that, because they've already rejected it in their heart. And they begin to, so this, in this story, there was this total loss of truth, because the truth was too dangerous. People were going to use it to hurt themselves, hurt each other, and so without, with this unity being taken away, this unifying understanding, people using their false doctrines began to clash with each other. And this is described in Secrets of Heaven 13, 22. So that a man will be unable to understand the language of his companion means that they all clash or oppose each other. Being unable to understand the language of a companion is not acknowledging what another is saying. In an inner sense, it means not acknowledging what another teaches, or in other words, not acknowledging another's doctrine. They do, not acknowledge, they do acknowledge it with their mouth, but not with their heart. In harmony of the mouth is nothing in the face of discord at heart. The situation here resembles that of evil spirits in the next life. If you, if you're, if (laughs) he's like, hey, that resembles how spirits are in the next life. Oh yeah, oh yeah, how spirits, if you don't happen to feel like you know how evil spirits are in the next life, check out our episode, The Good Thing About Hell, where we get deeply into not only the arrangement of the dark side of negativity uh, of the spiritual world, but also how it's organized and what the the what the camaraderie and structure of evil spirits or people who have died and and devoted their lives to evil, what it's like. To to give you a brief explanation of it, here's a diagram. Uh, you can have evil spirits, according to Swedenborg, all working together on something as long as it's an evil purpose. Let's say all these purple people don't like that pink guy, and they all want to destroy him because he's a good person. While that's going on, they can all be working together in unity and feeling, yeah, we're all going to do this together. But if that guy steps into the background far enough where they no longer can see him, then suddenly they don't have this focus anymore. The bonds that held them together start to break, and because of the nature of evil, they turn on each other. This is what evil is. It's not... It's complete disdain for anything that's not you. So once you, once these other p- evil spirits around you aren't helping you, you're going to fight them because they're not you. So that is the nature of evil spirits in community, and this is the, the, the pattern that then these people in our story adopted because they were in league with hell. I mean, anything that we do that's evil or false is bringing us in society spiritually with hell, so that you begin to act like 
hell acts. And maybe in your life you've noticed some people acting like you feel like hell acts. So evil spirits were the agents of this clashing together. This is Secrets of Heaven 1320. The reason it says, let us go down and let us muddle their language in the plural is that a judgment is being executed and evil sp- and spirits, evil spirits, are the ang- agents. Don't you think it's interesting that, that us is there? It's because the actual harm being done, like this, the people clashing with each other, God doesn't do that. God doesn't drive people to fight each other. Angels don't do that. Evil spirits do, and the judgment is nothing more than what I said before. There's this threshold where when you engage in evil enough, you the further you engage in evil, the further you reject God and God's protection. So once you push him away enough, you're no longer protected from hell, and hell is of the nature we just showed. So they rush in and attack, and that that is this judgment is the, you lose the force field that you had around you, hell washes in, you get all this this chaos, but it's not quite chaos, because divine providence is pulling the strings, even though it's not God in there doing it, God is looking and making sure that the only evil that's allowed is going to lead to good, that everyone's as protected as they can be in that situation. It's not like he just steps back and is like, well, you had your chance. And we're going to talk about that more in just a second. But we're, let's continue with our story. This is Genesis 11, verse 8. And Jehovah scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. So there you have a scattering. This sounds like it's a dissipating of the thing, but what does it mean piece by piece? Let's take a look. Uh, the Jehovah scattering them over the face of the whole earth means they were not acknowledged. The result of this is they wanted to be, you know, initially acknowledged as greater than all people, but not people rejected it. They stopped building a city means doctrine of this kind was not accepted because they began to fight and clash with each other. The the common people, the good people that they wanted to subvert said, ah, no, I, I don't want this. We, we, we're not going to do this. So here's that verse in an internal sense. Those seeking total dominion through false doctrine were not acknowledged. Worship based on hidden evil self-love was not allowed to continue in this ancient church. Well, and why would you want worship like that? to continue. It was for the protection of the human race that God allowed this plan to be thwarted. And it was protection for the people that those evil people were going to subjugate, but also for the people them building the tower themselves. God is actually protecting them at the same time. Take a look at our show, Why Bad Things Happen. This is is our most complete episode on why are things allowed. You know, why is evil allowed sometimes and not allowed other, other times? And that'll give you a fuller sense of what we're going to describe here. But essentially, it, it is that those people that were building that tower, building that false way of looking at life, were in danger of harming themselves as well. This is Secrets of Heaven 1327. The point in allowing internal worship to die out and external worship to remain was to prevent profanation. The profanation of what is holy carries eternal damnation with it. No one is capable of profaning anything holy except those who possess a knowledge of the faith and acknowledge what they know. People who do not have that knowledge cannot profess it, let alone profane it. Deeper dimensions are what can be profaned because they have a holiness to them which shallower dimensions do not. This is also why we are allowed to live lives of indulgence and self-gratification, which lead us to disengage from deeper concerns rather than come into the knowledge and acknowledgement of those deeper realities and profane them. So you have this group of people that are in danger of harming themselves, because if they know what's true and acknowledge it, and yet intentionally use it to harm, that's a problem. If you just reject the whole thing, you don't know about it, then we're, eh, you know, you're, you're shielded in a certain way. And this is why the human race in general lost this contact with the spiritual world, with these deeper principles. That darkness is still echoing through us today because internal worship had to die out. It was left in some places, but in general, it was too dangerous to have around with, you know, all of the, the evil that was building up in people's hearts. So this was partially a protection from them. A little bit further on this is Secrets of Heaven 13 and 28. 
The fact that the first ancient church was stripped of what it knew about truth and goodness can be seen from the fact that most of the nations <coughs> composing that church became idolatrous. Idolatrous people outside the church meet with a much better fate than the same kind of people inside the church. The former are outward idolaters, the latter are inward idolaters. This, then, is the reason the conditions in the first ancient church changed. Swedenborg talks about uh, people who have these, who have what you would call idols, that they, they have figurines that they use in worship, but that actually this is just a symbol that lets them think about deeper things. It's, it's good. It comes away as good, Swedenborg says. But if you, if you are within the knowledge of what God is actually like, and, but you're, in spite of that, you're actually worshiping material things, then it's a problem. You know, it's, it's only this mixing of the deep knowledge uh, with evil and with twisting that really is this profanation stuff. However, if you're worried that you might have committed profanation or are committing it, you're not, um, because if you're worried about it, you, you know, that's already showing that you're not. Profanation is something that Swedenborg describes and people can get nervous about it, but it's not like you try to live well and then you backslide and you, no, this is like you understand everything, you believe it's true, and you completely do a 180 and are intentionally using that knowledge to harm people and doing that habitually and long term. It's not something you just fall into. And as we're seeing here, it's something that God works very, very hard to prevent. He, he let this whole church die out rather than letting those people profane themselves. So you're probably not doing it. That's what I'm going to say. So let's look at the very last verse here uh, in the story that we're going to read for today and see what the fallout from all this was. This is Genesis. For this reason, he called its name Babel, because there Jehovah muddled the language of the whole earth, and from there Jehovah scattered them over the face of the whole earth. I was going to say this is Genesis 11, 9, but you don't need me to say that. Computers have taken over my job. You can see that at the bottom of the screen. Let's look at this. For this reason, he called its name Babel. Name as a correspondence <clears throat> is means the full quality. When something is named in the Bible... It, its full quality is recognized. And whenever you see that, you, you, you hear so much in the Bible about the name of God. Why do people go on and on about it? It's because it's the quality, the name, call on the name of Jesus. It's the quality, it's the essence of the thing. All right, so let's look at our, at our, um, our piece by piece here. For this reason, he called its name Babel, is identifying an identification of this type of worship. Because Jehovah muddled the language of the whole earth, inward worship began to die out. And this was something that, because once it was identified that this is going to just go nowhere good, we have to scrap this thing and, and have this church take on new form. So here's that verse. This kind of worship was identified as self-worship, and knowledge about inward worship began to die out in this ancient church. And that, as I said, still has repercussions today because we're still sort of living in that fallout. I would hope that that knowledge is being reborn. You know, you see a lot of people learning a lot of stuff about life after death, about symbolism. Is that at all coming back? Hopefully. I mean, Swedenborg did predict that, that we're going to be restored to the, the, the depth of knowledge and the heaven on earth kind of stuff that we used to have, so maybe it's already happening. In the biblical story after this verse we just did, it goes into these genealogies, like so-and-so begat so-and-so, the other parts of the Bible, how can this be anything valuable? But Swedenborg says that that is a description of the, since this way of doing the, the ancient church was dying out, God had to give us kind of an intermediate step. Okay, here's new ways that people can connect. That's what all these different people being born symbolize. It's not an ideal uh, sequence, because God would have, you know, rather had it be these this church that was there originally because it was this deeper connection, but the genealogy sort of symbolizes this is what we can make do with, you know, and that, so when you see those genealogies in there, that's what Swedenborg says they are. All right, we've seen the fall, we've seen where religion went wrong, this Babel that, and it still goes wrong today, you still have people trying to build these towers, it's all a lot of negative bad stuff, people are, people are hurting, the, the ancient church dies out, is there anything good? I mean, is there hope? Is Does religion ever go right? Should we keep at this thing? How can we avoid this fate 
uh, that these people went through in our day-to-day -day lives. Well, we got some thoughts on that in the last section here. What's the alternative? What can we do to avoid the negative but bring out the positive aspects of re religion? Well, one essential is is freedom, is the opposite of this Babel thing, and, and Dr. Lawrence commented on that a little bit more. Religious domination and abuse um, comes with the territory of power. Swedenborg was well aware of that, um, yet he was keenly focused on the need for freedom uh, in order for anything religious or spiritual uh, in an authentic way to take hold inside of a person. So he was uh, much against any form of uh, exertion or coercion in religion did not uh, advocate for even a preaching style that would seemingly be emotionally manipulative, uh, such as revivalist uh, type preaching. Uh, he felt the only way for religion to do its work was for those who were uh, doing the work of religion to exert great care over the freedom of the people that, uh, that uh, were in, they were in engagement with to uh, come to their own, come to their own terms to be able to consider things and ponder things and make make their own decisions. So Swedenborg was a a, a voice for a religion that was not power over but power for, uh, an empowering presence in the the lives of people so that they could attain the personhood for which they were created. That's good. We like that. We, the personhood for which we were created, this power with, we, we like that. And we, we see that. You do see that in religion. You do see flashes of this good thing. So how do we get there? How do we make it so that's this story instead of this Tower of Babel? Well, the first thing we have to do is avoid this Tower of Babel. So what is that? Swedenborg says Babel or Babylon means worship based on selfish love, or, or it's really conducting worship and the elements of it just for our own benefit and to use it as a means of power. This is Secrets of Heaven 1326. Self-love is nothing but the conviction that we answer to ourselves alone. The fact of the matter is that the more self-love or a misplaced sense of in independence worms its way into our worship, the more internal worship recedes or becomes non-existent. Inward devotion consists in an affection for what is good and an acknowledgement of truth, but the more egoism or self-dependence advances or enters, the more an affection for goodness and the acknowledgement of truth withdraw or leave. Holiness can never coexist with profanation, just as heaven cannot coexist with hell. The one needs to be separate from the other, and this is, or that is what conditions in the Lord's kingdom and the way it is organized require. <clears throat> this is the reason why inward worship does not exist in those whose worship is called Babel. Instead, they worship something dead and even cadaverous that lies within. And what is that? That that worship is essentially the worship of our own needs over the needs of the human race. The Tower of Babel is this longing for dominion and for power. Uh, we need to make sure we don't build that tower. We're talking about this historical building of it, and it, you, you see it built in organized religions and all the examples that Jim was mentioning before, but we can build this individually when we want to be dominant with our beliefs, when we try to control people, lord things over people. We have to make sure that we don't do that on an individual level within religion or otherwise, just in life. We've got to make sure that we're not part of the problem. So to do that, we made you a couple of simple how-to and how-to-not videos. Let's begin with what we should not do. Let's say that we have an idea about God or an idea about ultimate reality, and we treasure it and we want to tell people about it. If there's other people we run into, some of them have their own beliefs about God already, some of them are wondering, we start talking about our belief about God. So far, everything's fine. However, if we say it and they seem to not be jiving with it, that doesn't make sense, I don't really like that, it becomes a major problem if we start to get mad and you see our connection 
to God actually, as soon as we're getting this wrath about us, becomes all squiggly and negative. And then we say, you got to believe how I believe. You have to do what I want. We try to use power and authority to force people to be a certain way. We have built the Tower of Babel, and we chase that poor green guy away too. So that doesn't work out well. You probably feel like you've had some people do that to you in your life. But what's the what's the flip side of that? What's the good thing? Let's start the exact same way. We've got beliefs that these beliefs matter to us. They mean something to us. We've had experiences that back them up. We want to tell people about it. These people are listening. We tell. Now, a little bit of that does go in. They accept some of what we say. It affects their worldview a little bit, and that's great. But listen, they're going to want to tell us something too. So instead of saying, no, it's all got to be my way, we let it, we stay open-minded, we let in a little bit of what they're talking about, and we say, hey, even though I know your head's not all the way red inside, we're friends. You know, we're buddies because you don't have to think exactly like I think for love and camaraderie to exist within us. And then we let other people express theirs. It doesn't mean that we have the exact same beliefs as them, but it means we're willing to at least think about it. We're willing to share and say, hey, even though we have these different ideas, you can still see the colors are distinct. We all know it's heading towards a good place. So that is the story of how we really should be acting uh, with this whole thing. All right, so next we got to look at outer worship, because does this mean that we don't need any outer worship, meaning churches, meaning rituals, meaning groups, whatever we do? It Actually, it can be a very useful thing, and it, the true worship is this internal loving and how you, you think and feel about stuff, but this external worship can be a very powerful part of that and a, a companion and an aid to that process in us. And Swedenborg describes this in Secrets of Heaven 16, 18, In an inner sense, worship means all union achieved through love and charity. We worship constantly when we have love and charity. Outward worship is merely an effect. Angels worship in this way so they have a perpetual Sabbath. As a result, the Sabbath at a deeper level also symbolizes the Lord's kingdom. While we are in the world, however, we really ought to worship outwardly as well. So so this is Swedenborg prescribing, you should do some kind of external worship. This could be in an organized religion, or this could be on your own, you know, in whatever way you want. But external worship stirs deeper dimensions, and it maintains the holiness of our external acts so that deeper elements can influence us. What is more, we absorb knowledge during worship and undergo preparation for accepting heavenly qualities. We also receive unconsciously the gift of holy states that the Lord preserves for use in our eternal life. Every state of our life returns in the other world. So we're building up these positive experiences and gaining this reverence. External stuff definitely has a place. And even churches, you know, as they exist now, they could be good things. They can be just fine. If if you happen to have a church and people are getting together there, they're coming together, they feel like there's community, they're sharing something together, that's great. Or if you have like a small group situation, people are talking to each other, they're connecting around ideas, that's powerful. Or if you're organizing through a church to go work in a soup kitchen or help or something like that, these are all good functions and things that churches are actually very good at organizing and getting together. So that that thanks to uh, Chuck Blair and New Church Live for those pictures. This It's good, but it's got to have, all religion has to have this internal component or this true worship, or else it won't work. So what is true worship? Again, Secrets of Heaven 7884. When people today talk about worship of God, they mainly mean worship of the lips in a church and private prayers morning and evening. However, it is not these that are the essential components in worship of God, but rather a life of useful activity. Worshiping by living a useful life accords with the arrangement ordained for heaven. Worship of the lips, too, is worship, but it does no good whatever unless we worship with our lives, because that is heartfelt worship. If worship of the lips is really to be worship, it must grow out of living worship. Useful activity meaning the things you do in your life, that you, whether it's your job or the other, the other things you do to serve, are exactly that, to serve the human race. That we're looking, our overall goal, our aim is what our love and our life is, and if that aim is, on some level, I want to make things better for people, then that's, that's love, and that's worship, and that is this God coming into us and through us. And that's what we can all be striving for in our communities and 
individually. And I want to end here looking at the alternative, because we saw this tower built out of these false and evil elements, but what about what's re- this, this same ascending to these heights, but in the way that we were meant to? So we're going to look at some images of mountains here with some quotes over them about true worship, remembering that, Im- that mountains are an image. So you're going to be seeing what worship looks like, like what this, this f- spiritual phenomenon we're talking about looks like represented physically while your brain learns a few things about it. So just relax and see what comes to you. I was thinking, you know, we should add another slide onto that, which is like a beautiful mountain, sun is coming over in clouds, and it says, please like and subscribe, but that would completely defeat the purpose, as I just did by saying this. Uh, Would you please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this at all before I made that comment? That helps our video get out. It, It will alert you when we get new things. It helps YouTube know that we're here and helps spread the message to people. Thanks so much for watching. As I said, we're going to get to our questions, but first, if you want to help make this kind of programming continue to be possible, consider, if you're in a good spot for it, making a donation. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. That's why we offer Swedenborg's books as free downloads on Swedenborg.com, and we produce this show and other content on our Off the Left Eye YouTube channel with no paywall or ads. The only way to keep this up, though, is for those of you who like what we're doing and feel comfortable giving, to give. If the idea of helping others have easy access to the content we produce feels meaningful to you, please consider supporting this cause with a donation. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. Everybody wins, so consider it. All right, let's do our questions. We explained a lot today, so I wouldn't be surprised if people had thoughts about it or thoughts about other things. So let's hear what you guys got. What does Swedenborg say about the different names that God is called by at different times in the Bible? They It's a great question, and they all have specific meaning in them. Uh, you see even, even um, you know, Jehovah, uh, God, Jesus, all those ones in the book of Revelation, like Prince of Peace and uh, wonderful counselor, all that. It all means, it's all different qualities. Swedenborg uses this one, God Shaddai, which is what God is referred to in the Bible in the context of temptations or struggles. Uh, there's a lot of different, you know, Jesus is is God saving. Um, there, there's a lot of different meanings to those, and it's almost like the different areas of life where we interact with God, because God is one but those different names are the different aspect. It's kind of like the the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as Swedenborg describes it, is like the infinite, unknowable divine, the human form that we can interact with, and then the this influence of divine providence on human lives. That those are those three names. So there's many, many names, but it's just different facets and different ways of looking at this this infinite thing. So great question, and you can get if you um, you know look at. Swedenborg stuff and search those different names in it, uh, you can find his specific references to those. So let's look at the next one. Cortland, due to Christian hypocrisy, there are many in the African-American community who believe that ancient religion is a true religion. How does Egypt figure into the good and bad in religion? Well, Egypt is a is a complex subject in, in Swedenborg. Uh, there's the historical country of Egypt, but there's a symbolism, much like 
you know, we had Shinar, the Valley of Shinar, um, in this episode, that it symbolizes something in particular. Egypt generally has a good and a bad symbolism, just like everything in the negative sense. It's like knowledge apart from apart from spirituality. You know, it's a symbol of. That's why the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites because this secular part of us can overwhelm the part that wants to be good. On the other hand, Swedenborg says that uh, that. Egyptian hieroglyphics have correspondences behind them, you know, so that there is this, there was this good knowledge uh, in there. So there, in terms of the true religion, there is truth in a lot of religions, you know, that there is this progression like we've been talking about here, where you have these different uh, different uh, ages in humanity, some is lost, it's transferred to the next one and transferred to the next one. So it's not that those ancient religions, you know, there's plenty in the Egyptian religions that aren't accurate, according to Swedenborg, but some truth has gone through, and really it's about how you're using it, because you have people, if there's people using that religion for love of the neighbor and love of humankind, then it's good. What you're saying here, there's people who have been harmed by Christianity. You know, this is, that's from people misusing Christianity. So Christianity is just as prone to, even though it contains a lot of accuracies, according to Swedenborg, um, or at least, you know, the, the core parts of it, he wouldn't agree with a lot of the, the doctrinal offshoots, but it contains a lot of accuracies, but it's actually maybe even more prone to being misused because of the depth of the participation in in these truths because it resonates with people, so there's more of a desire to kind of change it and mess with it. And Swedenborg says there was an initial period in Christianity when it was very much more true, but then it kind of fell apart at the Council of Nicaea, 320-something AD. Anyway, I, I don't know if I answered any of your question, but those were a few thoughts that I had on it. Thanks. Uh, next one. Sebabalo. Sebabalo. So is hell after death constructed with flames of fire? There are many, many versions of hell, as many as there are people who love hell, which are the people who are in hell. Uh, hell is nothing more than the state of mind where, you, as Swedenborg describes it, when the love of evil is felt as good, that is hell. So fire... In a, there's no fire in the spiritual world like there is in the physical world. Everything there is a reflection of deeper qualities. Swedenborg does talk about fire, but this is a representation of the evil burning within people. Hell is not like a pit of fire, an eternal pit of fire that you get thrown into and burned in as a punishment. It is, it is a state of mind where the evil cravings in you have completely destroyed your humanity. People in hell might think, oh, this is fun, this is where I want to be, but looking at it from afar and looking at it with insight, you see fire, you see these kinds of things as representations because it's reflecting that state. So it's a confusing question. The, overall, no, but there's not just one big lake of fire that you're burned in forever. It's people living lives, but they're just living dysfunctional lives, and the fire that's really burning down there is hatred. I mean, that is what causes the misery and hell, people's hatred for each other, their hatred for truth, their hatred for goodness, their hatred for God. So that's that's the fire of hell. And see our episode, The Good Thing About Hell, for a more complete description of the nature of, of hell, uh, according to Swedenborg. Thanks for the question. Next one. Francisco, what would our names, what would be our names in heaven? Would it be the same as here, or will it be different? Different! Or that's what I've heard. Um, people ha who have had experiences contacting the other side uh, say that they've heard different names now for people that they know. Swedenborg, I believe, also talks about that names there reflect your qualities. There's a passage in the Bible that says, I will give you a stone with a, a new name on it. So things there, we don't keep the same bodies, we don't look the same, we don't have the same names. All this stuff is material, it passes away, and there because here you can you can be named anything you can change your name it doesn't who you are doesn't define your name right and vice versa but there your name is an extension of your quality so whatever the essence of you is there's a word for it and that's your name on the other side or so says Swedenborg next one 
Bailey 31909, it seems that the Bible, if, if the Bible had been written in the language of angels, we might have had a more peaceful earth. And it does seem like that, because there's a lot in there that's like, oh, if they just told it like this, people wouldn't have gotten into war. So why, why is the Bible so confusingly written? Why is there so much violent imagery in it? I think that we see a clue about that actually in this story, in this episode, that God had to destroy this inner understanding of things because there was this danger that if people had known the real truths in the Bible, uh, or in the Word, it, you know, there wasn't the same Bible back then, but there was analogs, um, they would have used it for evil. They would have destroyed Look at how much people have used the current Bible stuff for evil, uh, but because Swedenborg says because it's written in this, this confusing language, people can't get at the core of it. They can't harm it. They can't harm themselves. So I guess the idea is overall that divine providence made that calculation, so in essence it does mean that it's actually, this is the better way to have it, that we would we do have a more peaceful earth because of that, even if that seems hard to believe. But it's a great thought, and, um, you know, I'd love to have a copy of, of that book that was just the internal meaning, um, or whatever we can get analogous to that, that would be cool. But, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully that'll be one of the things we come back into as we kind of move out of this dark age of, of humanity. All right, a couple more. Mike, hey, do you think I can still go to heaven even if I used to be skeptic about, about it for at least 10 to 12 years? Absolutely. You, there, you know, nobody is caged by their past. It's what you are like now, and it's what you do with what you have right now. If we're on this planet, we can still change. And also, you know, there's fine reasons to not believe. There's a lot of, you know, as we said, there's all kinds of negativity in religion, so that makes people skeptical. There's there's a million reasons to be skeptical. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. Uh, God is not looking for revenge because, hey, you didn't believe for a while. doesn't matter how long. It really matters, do we love people? You know, do we love people, and are we willing to be humble enough that if we do learn oh, actually, this is true, that we, we accept it. So you're going to be just fine, Mike. Thanks. All right, let's do two more. Joseph, is the Catholic veneration of statues like Mary against the Ten Commandments? It depends on why people are doing it. I would say for one Catholic, that might be a great practice, and for another one, it's misleading them. Because Swedenborg said, it depends on the person. Why are you looking at that statue? You know, is it a... Rem- and Swedenborg just directly describes the situation. Some people will have a statue of Mary, and to them that symbolizes something. It's a connection with God. They like it. It, it somehow is actually helping them connect to God. For other people, that could be a hang-up. It's a person-by-person thing. Overall, um, you know, there might be too much in that direction, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, it depends on what does it mean to you. What do you mean? It's the intention behind it, rather than whether or not you use religious symbols in the form of statues in it. So the Ten Commandments are on an internal level. It matters what you're thinking and feeling as you do it, or that's what I believe anyway. All right, one more. Elaine, if a person has a problem dealing with depression, will he or she have that same problem in heaven? I hope not. I was diagnosed with depression, and I would love to uh, have fully kicked it by then. The way I understand it, Depression is partially a physical ailment. You know, your your brain is messed up, and in in heaven, you don't have that same uh, issue because the spiritual body is is beholden to different forces in the physical body. But also, Swedenborg says all unrest is from evil and falsity. Meaning, the pain of depression is hell, uh, messing with you. It's through the a messed up brain, but it's it's all hell. Everything negative we experience is hell attacking us. The further we move into heaven, the more protection we have from hell. So you're going to become impervious to the kinds of stuff that used to bother you. So if if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, yeah, it's not going to last forever. That and you know, hopefully, the things we learn while we're here will make not having it even better. You know, it's a, you'll really know what it's like. Oh, I don't have it anymore. So absolutely, it's not a permanent thing. No, nothing negative is permanent. What's true and what's real and what's eternal is is a love and, and what's good, and we just got to grab that, and then God will wipe away every tear, as they say, so including these maladies that we have on this planet. 
so that's that. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate those questions. They're awesome. I, I try my best, but really, you'd be better off researching on your own, I think. Um, but but I appreciate you having that conversation with me. Join us next week. We're going to have a conversation with Howard Storm. Maybe you have heard of him. His book, My Descent into Death, was one of the first near-death experience books I read. It's It rocks, and he's cool, and we're going to talk a little Swedenborg and hear what he's doing now and what he learned in his experience and hopefully get some things that will help uh, sort of broaden and expand our uh, understanding of ultimate truth and ultimate reality. So I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. Take it easy.